I'm in Moralton, Arkansas, right by Petit Jean State Park, and right here is the Museum of Automobiles. Uh, this was a collection started by Governor Winthrop Rockefeller, and uh, it looks like a really cool building, and I think they're supposed to have a really good car collection, so let's go check this out. This museum was built and opened in 1964, as mentioned by Governor Winthrop Rockefeller, a few years before he actually became governor of Arkansas. The son of John D. Rockefeller Jr. and heir to much of the fortune, Winthrop collected antique cars, which he first showcased to the public at this really awesome facility atop Petty Jean Mountain. I found out it's locally pronounced Petty Jean. As far as I'm concerned, it hasn't changed all too much since the 60s, so this is one of the oldest auto museums in the country. Gonna make a wish by throwing a penny in the fountain. I am wishing for the same thing that everyone is at the moment. This is the very first museum I've visited since the emergence of COVID-19. The museum itself recently reopened. However, it is a new experience in some ways because I am wearing a mask, I am using lots of hand sanitizer, and you can only walk through the museum one way. No backtracking. Along with antique autos, there are some really cool old arcade machines and music machines. Here's a basketball pool game from the early 20th century. Fast, flashy, and fascinating. There's a classic jockey hitching post, and some model vehicles and memorabilia. Now onto the automobiles. The tour starts off with a 1981 DeLorean. Many auto museums turn their DeLoreans into Back to the Future time machines. And even though this one is silver, it is not rethemed. A seemingly more rare, fully original DeLorean, which was pretty unsuccessful on the market. This was the personal limo of Governor Winthrop Rockefeller. A beautiful 1967 Cadillac Fleetwood 75. The governor did live up here on the mountain, so he would drive himself around the area in this Cadillac limousine. I noticed the one-of-a-kind hood ornament. It's a bowl made of solid silver. This was Governor Rockefeller's 1951 Cadillac Fleetwood. This luxury limousine had heating and ventilation. Behind the governor's limo is a 1953 television from the era, and if you look at the limo's bumper, there's a Rockefeller campaign sticker on it. Here's a 1935 DeSoto Airflow. This was unique for the time because of its very streamlined design. The prior year's version was so streamlined that this version was actually a correction of its unpopularly radical design. There's also a carousel pony. This is the 1937 Chrysler Airflow, streamlined to look like a jet. Chrysler even performed wind tunnel tests on this model before it was released. Along with some cool Packard signage is a 1937 Packard Town Car with a rare pink and gold color scheme. And there's even a classic hood ornament adorning it. I wish cars could still have hood ornaments, but they don't because people will get horribly impaled by them in crashes. Moving on to some slightly less elegant vehicles, here's a 1947 Hudson Commercial pickup truck, also known as the Big Boy. This is a Ford Thunderbird from 1955. Very comfortable, but rather slow. Here's a 1933 LaSalle Town Coupe. By the way, I'm not an auto aficionado, so I don't know much about the technical side of these. Here's a 1948 Willys Overland Jeepster. This was one of Willys' first models for civilian Jeeps after World War II. This is the oldest car in the collection, a 1904 Oldsmobile Touring Runabout. Oldsmobiles were among the most popular cars in America before Ford and the Model T. Speaking of the Ford Model T, this is a 1923 Ford Model TT, an expanded truck version of the Model T, and this one is set up as a transport semi for oil by the H&G Oil Company that was based in Conway, Arkansas. I don't actually know if that company used this or they just rethemed it, but there's also an old gas pump. This is a 1952 Volkswagen Beetle, perhaps the second most important car in history after the Model T. This is freaking awesome, a 1914 
Cretor's popcorn wagon. Only nine of these were ever built, and largely built by hand by Charles Cretor's in 1914. This particular wagon was a very popular popcorn stand in Kalamazoo, Michigan, a landmark in its own right for 32 years of operation before Governor Rockefeller purchased it for his collection. It is an amazing relic of the past. There is so much detail on it. And I love the clown guy that would turn the case of peanuts in the window. The only place that I know of that has this contraption today is Disneyland. Next up, there's a 1937 Ford Phaeton. I really like this one, the 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air Convertible, a true icon of the 50s. This is a Willys Amphicar Plainsmith, built in 1941 and bought for $856 at the time. Not too many of these were made because Willys soon got big military contracts for World War II, which was much more profitable. This is a 1941 Chevrolet half-ton truck. The owner of this purchased it days before the bombing at Pearl Harbor, then sat for years in storage while he served in World War II, only to be finally restored in the 80s. I've got to say, this is a top-notch museum, and all of the cars are in immaculate condition as far as I can tell. Well, this is unexpected. This was President John F. Kennedy's 1963 Lincoln Continental. It was presented to President Kennedy by Lincoln, a division of Ford, for private use by the Kennedys. It was delivered to him in 1962. It was only used by JFK once or twice when he visited Hyannisport. He did drive it himself during those visits, and he was known for liking to go fast. So much so that on one occasion the Secret Service lost contact with him. John F. Kennedy once sat right there and drove this car. Of course, Kennedy would be assassinated in 1963, coincidentally in a different open-top Lincoln Continental limousine. Interestingly, JFK's car is now owned by the William J. Clinton Foundation. I thought this museum displayed Bill Clinton's 1967 Mustang that he owned before he was governor of Arkansas, but it wasn't on display. So I'll take JFK's car, that certainly made up for it. Here's a 1929 Marmon Coupe Model 68, an attempt by the Marmon Company to make an affordable vehicle. There's a mini car, and a much bigger and fancier car. There's an original set of Burma Shave signs. They used to serve as advertisements along the highways and byways, but they were spaced out to be read as you drove by. A suspenseful plug to use Burma Shave shaving cream. Here's an old one, a 1909 Buick Model 10 touring car. This is a 1917 Maxwell touring car, billed as the Wonder Car back in the day. A 1941 Chevrolet Deluxe, a stylish and luxurious four-door vehicle. Here's a Cadillac Eldorado from the 50s. Here's a 1958 Chevrolet Corvette, Corvettes being the first and only successful fiberglass sports car back in the day. This is a Chevrolet 3100 from the late 40s. Interesting color choice. The iconic 1954 Chevrolet Bel Air. This is a 1939 Packard 120 convertible sedan. A beautiful car. Wouldn't mind having one of these. And another surprise. Elvis Presley's 1967 Ford Fairlane 500 Ranchero. So Elvis had a lot of cars and you can see them at museums all over the country and even the world. But this one was known as the King's Ranchero. He purchased it on Valentine's Day 1967 for Priscilla to use on his new ranch in Mississippi. He did have to sell the ranch and this car a year later due to his movie career. It's still labeled on there that's from the Circle G Ranch in Horn Lake, Mississippi. This is another 1924 Ford Model TT. The TT could be sued for a variety of purposes, and this one was used to transport kids from the local high school. Here's an old player piano. Sadly, it doesn't play. This is a 1924 Chevrolet one-ton truck. There's some vintage motorcycles and a collection of license plates. 
the classic 1915 Model T couplet. This is a Chrysler Sports Coupe from 1926, designed for men of means. It even had a compartment for golf bags. This is a 1912 Page Beverly Touring Car. This is an interesting vehicle, a 1932 Chevrolet Confederate Deluxe Special Sedan. That year Chevrolet did a Confederate series, and these became popular gangster mobiles. This is a 1928 Ford Model A Phaeton. A 1931 Ford Model A Coupe. And here's a 1929 Ford Model A Town Car. This is a pretty rare one, a Star Station Wagon from 1923. Station wagons were not popular back in the Roaring Twenties, but the Durant Company, which produced this one, was perhaps the top competition with Ford in the lower price field, so they attempted station wagons. In 1919, some Little Rock guys founded the Climber Motor Company and started producing cars, keeping Southern America in mind by designing these to be able to drive roads that weren't paved well. This is a 1932 Climber Model 650 and one of only two Climber cars still in existence since they were only able to produce about 200 cars before they had to shut down. Here's a 1924 Chevrolet Deluxe Superior Touring Car. Despite its superiority, windows were not available on this car except for the windshield. Here's a 1925 Ford Model A Station Wagon. These are pretty rare to find, especially in this good of condition. Last time I was at the Henry Ford Museum's Greenfield Village, I got to ride in one of these. There's a mannequin lady, a Victrola machine, and one of the oldest car buggies in here, the 1908 Sears Model J Runabout, which you could order out of a Sears catalog. And in this corner they have some more vintage arcade machines. I appreciate that this car museum does include a little more than just cars. There's even an antique gun collection on display. It is great to be back in a museum where I belong, and what an incredible collection and display in this 1960s facility. Definitely one of the best auto museums I've been to, and you should come too. Please subscribe and check out my other videos, including one on the adjacent Petty Jean State Park, and thanks for watching.